Amen. Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, uh, first and foremost, to be in your presence. Father, we invite you to uh, move in our hearts and our lives, Lord. We ask, Lord, that we can live lives to glorify you. Thank you so much for all that has happened thus far in the service. Thank you for the testimonies, God, and uh, thank you for the Bon Giovannis, their faithfulness uh, through the years, God, and uh, their new chapter in Vegas. I pray that you use them in a powerful way here in the family in Vegas. And God, just ask that you uh, help me to step out of the way and, and, and be able to be a vessel for honor for you, Lord. Uh, I pray that your word will speak to all, each of our hearts, Lord. And at the end of the day, Father, at the end of our lives, that we will bring you glory. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, be turning in your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 4. We are continuing with our series on the book of Mark. Uh, I hope that it's been a blessing to you. It's been uh, a, a great blessing to me to be able to study it out, uh, to rediscover some old things and to pull out of uh, the old things some new things. And um, so. We're going to be in it for a while. Next week, Nadine and I, we've been asked to speak in the Antelope Valley. Her, uh, She's going to be speaking at a Women's Day on Saturday. I'll be preaching to the congregation in, in the Antelope Valley uh, that Sunday. And so I just want to let you know, Lester's going to be preaching on Mark chapter 5. Amen. And I uh, appreciate the, the partnership in the gospel with him. And uh, so please read ahead. It's okay to read ahead. Okay. So be reading, uh, especially chapter 5 for uh, next week as we study that out. And so just in way of review, we studied 2 and 3 last week and we we discovered uh, John portraying Jesus as the Lord, the Lord of the Sabbath, the Lord of life, the Lord to forgive uh, sin. He is the one that sets a standard for right and wrong. Uh, He was misunderstood by the insiders, but he was adored and revered by the outsiders. Because Jesus came to seek and save what was lost and to heal those who were sick. And it was interesting, those who saw themselves healthy and found rejected him. And those that found themselves sick and unrighteous embraced him. And so really the challenge to us in a lot of ways is, are we on the inside or are we on the outside? Jesus could truly be understood only through seeing him in the cross, because even during that time, his disciples didn't fully understand who they were serving, who they were loving, who they were preaching. And we're going to see that more in in, in chapter four. And really, as disciples of Jesus, we could only understand our lives in reference to the cross. Because Jesus, and and we're going to study this more and more, that Jesus calls us to carry our crosses. And that's when we fully understand our lives, our purpose, and our calling is in reference to the cross. But we're going to pick it up in in Mark chapter 4. And this is a favorite of so many of us because this is probably what we cut our teeth in on on Bible talks. And uh, it's the go-to when we don't have a lesson. Let's do the parable of the sowers. We can't mess that one up. All right. So we're going to see Jesus teaching in parables. And and what's important about this is is this is Mark recording the content of Jesus's teaching, not just his actions. Up to this point, we see a lot of action, 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 action. And we actually are, uh, Mark captured some of the preaching and the content of Jesus's preaching to the people. And Jesus spoke to the people in parables. Now, many of us know what a parable is, but some of us don't. And so I want to explain what that is. A parable basically is a short fictional story. It means, it literally means setting things beside each other for clarification, right? So it's a short fictional story using everyday subjects to convey a moral attitude or spiritual principle. And Jesus uses many of these in Matthew and in in Luke. Uh, Many more are recorded. Many more parables are recorded. And just a few are recorded in Mark. And the purpose behind it is twofold. Number one, it's to really test whether people are listening or paying attention. Do they really want to know what Jesus is talking about? Because in order for them to really understand the parable, they really had to listen. They really had to pay attention. They had to take in not only what's being said, but who's saying it. 
And the other purpose is to keep those who really didn't want to know out. Okay, by their own lack of true listening and their lack of understanding who is being who is saying what and putting their faith in Jesus. Because when someone heard a parable, it was something that they could relate to. So it wasn't something that was necessarily above their head. It was something that they could relate to, something that they can touch or feel or look and and see. And Jesus was through these parables, actually trying to convey secrets or mysteries of the kingdom of God. And the thing that I want to help us to see is that we, many of us, if not all of us, we are privy to information, to secrets, to mysteries that were, that were mysteries for thousands of years. And now we've heard it and we've responded. And something that Jacob pointed out, he said, it only really made sense as I started putting it into practice. Jesus makes no sense. The Bible makes no sense. God makes no sense by just observing and saying, hey, let me just be an observer, not a participant. And, you know, the Bible starts getting weird when we stop obeying the Bible. It becomes like, oh, man, do I really want to do that? That doesn't make any much, any sense. But when you start doing, it, you're like, now I see why God is doing it. And parables were, were there. And the key word that you'll, you'll see at the very beginning, Jesus uses a, a Greek word, akuo, listen. And this morning, I want to give us all the challenge to listen. Because we're going to be tempted to tune out because we've seen it or we've heard it. We're going to be tempted to say, ah, I already know all this stuff. I can't wait till Mark chapter 5 because that's the good stuff. It's not the parable of the sowers. I've heard it a hundred times. But he starts off the parable by saying, listen. Jesus was calling them to listen to what he was saying. But not only that, he was calling them to put their faith in him and in what he was teaching. And I just want to start with asking, how grateful are you to be given the secrets of the kingdom of God? How grateful are you when we read the Bible, when many of us read the Bible, we understand it. We understand what it means. Have we forgotten what it was like when we opened the Bible and it was just gibberish? When we we would go to church and they would preach and we're just like, what does that even mean? Because we weren't intending to follow it. We weren't basing our lives off of it. It was all theory. But we need to have a sense of gratitude, profound gratitude that Jesus and through his Holy Spirit has given us access to what the angels long to hear. That's what we have through Christ. And I pray that we are grateful in that. And the other thing that I would I would say is this morning we have to ask ourselves, is there anything in our lives that's preventing us from hearing the word from truly listening? From truly putting it into practice, are there things in our lives that are preventing us from doing that? And if there are, then I want to challenge you to really listen today. Because I believe that through it, God and the Holy Spirit will speak to you on what actions that we need to take. So let's start by reading Mark chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in his teaching said, listen. Because I'm sure they're like us. They were probably talking amongst themselves, fellowshipping and stuff like that, eating their fish and loaves and be like, yeah. And Jesus said, listen. And it's believed that he he was speaking from the boat to a, a place where his voice would be amplified naturally. A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plant so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 times. Then Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let them 
hear. Not everyone had ears to hear. Not everyone was listening. And see, this is what I'm talking about, profound gratitude. We read this and we say, I know what it means. But there were hundreds of people when Jesus just spoke. He's like, man, why is he talking about farming? What's the deal with Jesus? He was a carpenter, not a farmer. What does he know about farming? And that's obvious a sower doesn't know anything about farming either because he should have plowed his field and he should have gingerly placed each seed down instead of just throwing. That's just a waste of seed. You understand what I'm saying? They're critiquing Jesus on the parable instead of searching out what is the meaning. Verse 10. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. That statement blew me away because I always imagined Jesus just talking to the twelve. But it says the twelve and others. There were other people other than the twelve that were following Jesus around faithfully. They were part of the crowd, but then they got alone with Jesus. So proximity to Jesus was very important. How close we are to Jesus is very important because it says he told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is is said in parables so that they may be ever seeing, but never perceiving and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. People say, well, you know, Jesus is inclusive. He is. He absolutely is. He wants all men to be saved, but not all men want to listen. Not all men want to be saved. Not all men want the truth. But he says the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? And of course, the answer is, "Uh, uh, uh, no. That's why we're hanging with you, Jesus. How then will you understand any parable? So by unlocking the secret of this parable, Jesus is giving them a key. To understand future parables. Anyone ever hear anyone ever grow up speaking pig Latin? Right. What's the key? All right, who can who can give me uh, who can give me um, Jesus is Lord in Pig Latin? No, 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 stand up and do it. Who can do it? All right, Shelley. Good try, good try. Oh, yeah, no, 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 good job. Okay, there you go. Parents didn't know the key. So the kids are talking back and forth. The parents are like, what are you? Stop that gibberish. But they're actually communicating. And that's kind of what it was. Once you had the key, you're like, oh, this is cool. Now I know a foreign language. I don't have to take one in high school anymore. But the key is important. And it goes on. The farmer sows the word. So the seed is the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seed sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown along, uh, among thorns. So there's a sower. And here are the different soils. It says, uh, still others like seeds sown among thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Doesn't say kill it necessarily, just it's not fruitful. Others like seeds sown on good soil hear the word, accept it and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. And, you know, when, when you're when you sow something and it's 100 times, a lot of times that's looked at as God blessing it. It's not normal. It's God really blessing it. 30, you're like, ah, that makes sense. 60, wow, you're really blessed. 100, God is at work. So. He pulls the 12 aside and he says, hey, the sower 
sows a seed, the word. Well, the sower, Jesus is implying, in my opinion, it's him. Because think about it. They're watching Jesus just preach to everybody. What is he doing? Scattering a bunch of seed. And they're like saying, Jesus, not everyone is following. Not everyone has the same response. Not everyone is around you. Jesus says, you know why? Because some seed falls on the path. And as soon as they hear it, Satan comes and steals it from them. Why? Because they're really not interested in following me. They just want to see miracles. They're just here for the show. And then there are some, man, they hear it. They're like, Jesus is awesome. You're crazy. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, man. I shouldn't follow Jesus. Jesus is awesome. I'm going to kick you out of the temple. Okay, never mind. Jesus is not that great. Trouble or persecution comes. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. I'm in for a comfortable life. Carry my cross. Oh, Jesus, I'm sorry. I misunderstood you. I thought you were going to feed us again. And then you had the third soil where it's among... Thorn. So you, you throw the seed out there and, the, and it actually takes root and it begins to grow and it grows and grows. But you know what? That soil is also growing other things along with the word. And it overpowers the word, making it unfruitful. See, Jesus is and then you and then you, you have the good soil that 30, 60, 100 times. Jesus says the issue is not the seed. The issue is not the sower. The issue are the hearts of the hearers. The soil. And again, so this would be the time, you know, most of us who might be cynical or been around for a while is like, okay, you now you're going to tell me I'm the third soil. Now you're going to tell me I'm the second soil. Now you're going to tell me I'm the first soil. I'm not telling you squat. What does the word of God tell you? Which one are you? As disciples, we should be sowing just as freely as Jesus sowed his seed. We become expert farmers. Where we just sow one seed at a time. Jesus says, just throw the word out there. Just let, just let it fall. Let it go. Just be a sower just like me. Jesus was teaching his disciples how to do ministry. See, because the ones seated around him, those were the good soils. Jesus was saying, hey, look at me. I'm just, I'm just sowing, I'm sowing, I'm sowing. I'm I'm not, I'm not particular. And I'm not worried about where the seed falls because it will grow. But you see, when we look at our lives, when we look at what we have, we see ourselves, we should see ourselves in two places. We should see ourselves, number one, if we're disciples, we should be sowing as Jesus did. But number two, we've got to ask ourselves a question. Are we 30, 60, or 100? See, I'm, I'm, making, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. It's not whether or not you're good soil. It's just how much are you producing? How much is the kingdom of God, that seed, that word, producing in you? The key is closeness to Jesus. And I cannot emphasize this enough. It's not just Bible knowledge. How close are you walking with Jesus? Because he will tell you everything that you need to know. Those disciples would be clueless unless they were walking with him. He's the key. I want you just to take two minutes. And yes, we're going to cut into preaching time. I want you to take two minutes. Wherever you are. Wherever you are spiritually. And I want you to ask yourself, which, if any of those soils, describes you best? Where you are right now. Read it again if you need to.
I didn't start, I didn't look at my watch, so I think that's two minutes. What needs, what needs to happen for you to become good soil if you're not already? What needs to happen in your life, in your heart, in your mind, in your listening for you to be the good soil if you're not already? And this is an important question to ask. Because we can go around, you got to remember that third seed, they see the grain, is, they, they see the plant, it's just not producing any fruit. As sowers, and finally, as sowers of the seed, how can we be as free and generous as Jesus at sowing God's word? Let's just get it out there. Some of you guys missed the class, and I want to invite you out to how to study the Bible with people class taught by Dale at, early, at 9 o'clock in the morning. It's going to be that way for the next seven weeks. Why? Because we're getting ready to figure out how just to sow, how to just throw it out there, how to throw out God's word. But let me tell you this. You don't have to come to class before you start sowing the word. Just throw it out there. Just throw it out there. He goes into other parables. He talks about a lamp. You don't put a lamp under a bushel. And he talks about making sure in verse 24, consider carefully what you hear. He continued with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. We are not made to be stagnant in our knowledge and our secrets of the kingdom of God. We're meant to grow in them. If we have a little, that means we're supposed to get more. But if we stop listening, if we stop holding, he says, even what you have is going to be taken away. Consider carefully what you hear. So every Sunday, we hear messages every Sunday. And I just ask you, do you consider what you hear? Why? Again, it's the emphasis on listening. Verse 26, he also said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seeds on the ground night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. Though he does not know how, all by itself, the soil produces grain. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because a harvest has come. First Corinthians chapter three, verse six. He says, man, we just water, we just plant and God makes it grow. We are so concerned. Can, can we do anything to make a plant grow? We could fertilize it, we could water it, we could do, but that's all we're called to do. And so what's blow away is this. I don't know how it works. We share the word with people. We share our faith with people. We, we point people, give them scriptures. We want to see growth right now. I don't know when that word, I don't know when that seed is going to germinate and start growing. It might be 15, 20, 30 years from now, but you better plant and you better water. And that's the beauty of we have this anxiety in our congregation that we've got to make things grow. I have it. You have it. Things got to grow. Things got to grow. Things got to grow. Okay, let's let's water and plant, but we got to make it grow. That, that's God's job. This brother's not changing. This brother, this sister's not changing. This brother's not changing. They might not change for 10 years because that seed is taking its time to produce fruit in their lives. And so what's created is this anxiety about speed. None of us would make good farmers. <laughs> Maybe Dexter. Because he could tell the difference between wheat and the other thing that I put up there that one time. Many of us would not make good farmers. Because we would just be anxious about the lack of growth that we see. But once it breaks through the ground, man, it starts going. But it might take a while to break through the ground. And he goes on in verse, in verse um, 20, 30, I'm sorry. Again, he said, what shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? 
It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seed on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. It says, with many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his disciples, again, when they were with Jesus, he explained everything. And so I, I want us to ask ourselves a couple things. And, and that, you, it's not a great picture. I'll go back to this. If I did my research correctly, this would be uh, maybe black mustard. But the thing about black mustard plant is it's invasive. I think San Diego County deals with mustard plant invasions. It's, it's, it's invasive, meaning that once it starts to grow, it grows everywhere. In a short amount of time, it could take over an entire plain of a, a, a field. That's what the kingdom of God is like. It starts off small, inconspicuous. I mean, what, I mean, think about it. Twelve guys, Jesus, kingdom, man. Eh. Two thousand years later, pervasive. It's everywhere. People are still talking about it. it. Didn't start that way. For some of us. God is just waiting for us to see or waiting for us to 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 allow the kingdom to invade our lives, maybe for the first time or maybe again. He's just saying, what's the kingdom fruit in your life? And that's the thing. Once the kingdom, once we grab hold of God's will being done in our lives, if we truly grab a hold of it, it starts infecting every every single area of our lives. You ask yourself, what area of life does you say, did you, as Jesus tries to touch you, you slap his hand and say, no, that's mine. No, 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 Jesus, don't touch that. That's Netflix. No, no, don't touch that. I know it's got some stuff in it, but no, that's my, that's my, that's my jam. That's my show. No, Jesus, don't touch my job. Don't, don't, don't do it. Don't you touch it. It took me 15 years to get to this position. I'm not going to let anyone, including you, ruin it. Me think about it. Is the kingdom overtaken your life? I'm not telling you if it did or not. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit tell you if it did or not. What does this fruit of the kingdom look like in your life? Still there? Or did we get some herbicide? Start fighting it back. Start using the fire. Start burning it away. Start trying to control it. See, that's a thing. God doesn't want his kingdom controlled in our lives. He wants it running rampant. I like what Jane shared. You know, she's going to churches and churches like, you're too fanatical. I hope that's never said here. Oh, bro, you're too committed. Man, you want me to go to everything, man. That's just, that's too committed. You want me to show up at 9 o'clock, learn how to study the Bible with people? Man, I got to sleep. You want me to, you want me to lead people? I don't even listen. I, they're not going to listen. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing what, if we let God's, kingdom run rampant in our lives the fruit is going to be jesus the fruit is going to be impact i've heard it said that the number one missionary field in the world today is the united states foreign missionaries are coming here to convert people because americans aren't converting americans because i think we fought back the invasive kingdom way and we prefer the tame way the safe way not the radical way what if any are the things what are, what are the competing what are the competing kingdoms in our heart i know i got them probably the biggest thing that my age ministers combat is comfort in our future what you know for 401k what, what's my 401k going to look like what's it going to be like for my kids in school and what is it going to be like for this we start looking for a soft place to land and we're in our 40s 
Some of you guys can relate because you're in your 50s and 60s and you're still looking for a place to land. Well, the 40 year olds see the 60 year olds and say, I'm talking about ministers now. They didn't plan well. I got to start planning now and I can't rock the boat. Oh, no, don't ask me to move, because if I move, I mean, my kids are of a certain age. And if, they're, if I move a certain age, I can, I can crush their faith. You don't think ministers have these discussions? You don't think ministers have kingdoms competing? You're like, but you're a minister. You, you've got the fruit of the kingdom. Oh, trust me. We battle. I see people, man, they work overtime. They get paid for that. I'm like, man, I'm not going to pay for working overtime. <laughs> I'm on a salary. You see other people going off and just, you know, doing whatever they want to do, whenever they want to do it. Sometimes show to church, sometimes don't church, show to church. You don't think ministers are like, I want that freedom. Service would be really short. And that is service after our singing will be dismissed because the minister didn't show. But that wouldn't happen in this church because all of you guys are ministers. Amen. You see? See how that works? Aren't you glad you don't go to church where it all depends on the minister? Amen. But we wrestle too. In fact, I challenged some ministers at this minister's retreat we were at. I'm like, they're, some of them were complaining about, hey, you know, I'm not getting a shot. I'm not getting a shot. I'm like, man, go somewhere. Pick up your stakes, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying, and go to some small church that needs a leader. Yeah, you won't get paid as much. Yeah, you might not be able to start building up your 401k. And yes, your kids might have to go to a school district that's not the best in the land. But are you willing to sacrifice everything for God in his kingdom? I know I am. I know we are. That's why we're here. To fight back those other kingdoms and to let the kingdom dream be invasive and pervasive. And it didn't destroy our kids' faith. It helped them to become Christians. Because they have parents that live not out of comfort, but live out of calling. But we should have a church where everyone lives not out of comfort, but lives out of calling. What is God calling you to? And finally, they cross over, a big storm hits, and they're saying, Jesus! There's four questions that are asked in this passage. Don't you care that we're going to die? Guess who asked that question? The disciples. Jesus fires back after he comes a storm or during the storm he fires back a couple of questions of his own he says why are you so afraid look we're gonna die let me ask you again why are you so afraid have you still no faith i think those two questions were better than the first question jesus stands up calms the storm And they ask this question, who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I submit to you, they were in the storm, and they didn't know who they had on the boat. You're like, but but they're in the inner circle. They're there, and, and they hear the secrets of the kingdom. They see all this stuff. They weren't listening. The storm listened better than they did. Think about it. The whole motive motif in chapter four is listening. Are you listening? Do you hear what the spirit is saying? All nature, if Jesus says jump, they say how high. That's what the earthquakes are are about. When the storms rage, Jesus says, be still. And they stop. And the disciples are like, who is this guy? They don't even know who they have in the boat. Do you know who you have in your boat? Because I know some of us are going through storms and we're asking the question, God, don't you care? God's like, yeah, I care. But do you know who I am? Yeah, you're Jesus Christ, the son of God. So why are you scared? Do you still have no faith? 
I need a job. I need this. I need that. I want this. I want that. Jesus is like, do you know who's on your boat? Do you know him? I've been a disciple for 20 years. Do you have 20-year-old faith? Do you have 20-year-old fruit? Do you have 20-year-old kingdom passions? Because the longer you're in something, the better you should be. Yet Christianity has a funky way of the longer that you're in it, the less fired up you become. I don't know why it works that way. Oh, yeah, I know why. Because we forget who's on the boat. We grow comfortable. They thought, hey, we're scared. Jesus must. Be. Oh, Jesus, you're sleeping. You're asleep on the job. Jesus is like, that's because we're not. I know we're not going to die. You're not going to die. But do you know who's on your boat? I forget at times who, you know, Jesus, are you here? It's like, yeah, I'm here. I'm sleeping. Because I'm at peace. Why aren't you at peace? I'm on your boat. We should have lives that Jane was talking about full of joy. Not easy, not, not easy lives, not problem-free lives, but there should be peace. I appreciate what, what, what Drew shared. You know, the gratitude is an action. Do you know him? Do we still have that faith that says, you know what? God, I'm going to trust you with everything. And I'm, not, I'm just not going to worry about it. Now, you sorry, Delon, are you saying be irresponsible? You're not listening. Delon, are you saying that, you know, I should just give up everything and sell everything and not have a job and not? You're not listening. Are you saying that I should have a laissez-faire attitude and just not care about anything? You're not listening. Because what I am saying is we've got Jesus in our boat and some of us live like we don't. Some of us live like we do and we look at those people and those are the people we go to. Right? Because they're like, man, how can you be at peace? You're going through all this stuff. How can you be joyful? How can you do all this? We go to those people. Because they know who's on their boat. I mean, you think, you, you think right now, just, just one second, two seconds, who do you go to when you're spiritually in trouble? Those are people that have Jesus in their boat. Those are people we know have Jesus in the boat because they live that way. My question is, do people come to us because we know we have Jesus in our boat? Well, bro, I've only been a Christian for, for, for a year. I've only been a Christian for three years. So you, you've been walking for Jesus with, for a year? That's awesome. Jacob was, where's Jacob? Weren't you, you were in, I was in Orange County when you were in Orange County, right? Were you in my campus ministry? Yeah. Huh? 21 years ago. I didn't know a whole lot more than Jacob. I was sitting back, I'm like, yeah, man, I remember. Did you go to OCC? Or Irvine, Saddleback. We had all these, we didn't know what we were doing. But you know what? Jesus was in the boat. We'll figure it out eventually. 21 years later, we got kids. I'm speaking. I mean, it's crazy. Do you know them? I was listening. I heard that. (laughs) You're like, time's up. Drew said it was going to be a little bit longer. Guys, I want to close out with this. This is a this is one of those passages of scriptures that we read over. We skip over. We've heard it. We've heard it. We've read it. We've heard it. I pray that this morning we might have heard it in a different way. I pray that we are listening. Because how we listen determines the fruit in our lives. How we listen determines our eternity. How we listen will determine whether the storms destroy us or propel us in our faith. Jesus knows who he is. And he left his word and he left his people 
behind to remind us. The question I have for you is, are you listening? Thank you.